Chad Daly, Captain on Rescue 9. Today we're going to go over the use and functions of the MSA 6000 camera. Before we do that, we're going to go over the NFPA 1801 guideline pertaining to the function of these cameras and the use of these cameras in the fire service. What does it mean to us? When it comes to the design function, they've dictated many things there that will make these uh, common across the board no matter what brand of camera you buy. The performance is going to meet minimum standards. The testing they put these cameras through, uh, which is quite rigorous, is going to be the same so you know what quality of pro product you get and they will be certified. One of the primary things written in 1801 is that the green power button will be located front and center and be operational with a gloved hand by a firefighter. That button will also always take you back to the basic mode. 1801 is going to define the displaying colors that we're using when we're in that basic mode. Those colors are going to be gray and white on your screen along with yellow, orange, and red as you reach the, reach the higher temperature limits. The viewing area must have three vertical sections showing alarm indicators, operation indicators, and temperature sensing indicators. Accessories cannot interfere with the camera thermal imaging operations. Battery life is also dictated by 1801, a minimum of two hours. Ours are three and a half, most commonly, but that can be driven down by temperature of the environment that you're using the camera in. The refresh rate is also dictated by 1801. If you're currently using cameras that are not 1801, you'll find the refresh rate a much longer time between your refresh rates. Much better bolometers and bigger focal arrays have enabled this. Effective temperature range is much broader with an 1801 camera and these 1801 cameras are upgradable. The software is upgradable so hopefully you can not incur expenses in the future and still be able to upgrade your cameras. How do the thermal imaging cameras work? They detect infrared energy and translates it into a usable in image in shades of gray, yellow, orange, and red. Infrared energy has a wavelength 20 times larger than visible light, allowing us to see through smoke. Any object above negative 459 degrees will emit, emit heat. Basically, any object on Earth emits heat. Higher the heat, the more infrared light is emitted. This is what's going to give us the image on our camera. Infrared energy, often confused with night vision and x-ray. Night vision uses available light. Uh, we can't confuse these, they op operate different, completely differently. Objects must have thermal contrast. Whiteout is a characteristic of old technology. Today's thermal imaging cameras are less likely to occur, but, but still can when thermal saturation has occurred. Thermal saturation is when the entire environment that you're in has reached the same or similar temperature, that's when your camera will white out. The camera is actually functioning properly. It's giving you a proper reading. There's ways that you can change that thermal saturation. You can regain that picture in many different ways. Using the thermal imager, object recognition. Stay focused on an object and, until you can identify it. Temperature identification. Establish baseline vitals for a structure. Temperature readings will lie. Look for increases and decreases in the temperature. When you're looking at temperature, you got to be aware of that you can get reflective heat depending on the objects you're looking at. And even if that temperature isn't correct, that's why we're going to monitor, monitor, monitor throughout the uh, incident. Anytime you enter another room, take another set of vitals on that room and monitor change. Interpretation. Use all the information, including your judgment, to interpret what the camera is showing you. Without adding common sense to the, what you're looking at, sometimes you can drastically misinterpret what you're looking at. Scanning using the thermal imager. When we scan, we need to scan high, middle, and low. What are we looking for? We're, when we scan high, we're looking for the temperature at the ceiling. It's very hard to predict flash over or roll over, but you can see it. Heat extension throughout a structure you can see. Compromised structural members, such as your, your trusses and joists, you'll be able to see that. Also any overhead objects that 
that could potentially fall or cause hazards to us. When we're searching the middle of the room, we're looking for victims, blind spots, fire load. Where is the fire? Where has it been? Where is it going? We also need to make note of any vent points or points of we could use for egress. Occupant type indication are things we're also looking for. Examples of that would be toys or cribs, stairwells, elevator shafts, floor temperature, and holes. When we look low, that's where we definitely want to check for the holes and look underneath stuff, look, look for our blind spots, and for victims that may be in vanishing points. Vanishing points would be uh, down some steps or behind the couch, anything you couldn't see through with the camera. We need to look behind things. So as you enter a room, you get your baseline vitals, you take your first look at the room. We make our way through that room to the other side. We need to pick the camera back up and reassess that room from the other side. That's going to give us a view of the room and behind the objects that we didn't see before. Heat energy. There's three different kinds of heat energy. We have passive emitters. Passive emitters will absorb heat and later give that heat off. Different kind of heat emitters will absorb and reflect heat at a different rate. Active heat emitters will radiate higher heat signatures when working than at rest. Direct heat emitters are going to be the fire itself or the sun. If you have a direct heat emitter that is hotter than the active heat emitter, your objects are not going to appear white in your white palette. We need to, we need to practice with the cameras in different environments so we can see what these different emitters look like. Reflectivity, objects ability to reflect heat, strong reflectors would be items such as glass and mirrors and very shiny surface metals. Also water. Our camera cannot see through the water. It's going to reflect. Weak reflectors would be painted surfaces. Some of the finishes found on tile. Uh, oftentimes the front of a tile may be a good reflector. The back of a tile may be a poor reflector. Concrete and wood floors depending on the finish. Our cameras can be very beneficial when it comes to size up. Many things we can look for when we're doing our size up. We can look for hazards, overhead power lines, structural is issues and integrity, security features, forcible entry issues, different and additional egress or entry points for our crews, fire department connections. We're also going to be looking for the fire itself. Where is it at? Where has it been? Where is it going? We can monitor our exposures with it. We can also use it in defensive application to monitor the direction of our master streams. If you have extreme amount of smoke and fire, we can monitor the structure with it too. This is again where we get baseline vitals, look at the structure, come back, reassess, see if there's been any change either in temperature or visually to the structure. Interior application. When we use it interior, there's many different functions besides search. We can use it for helping to advance the hose line, for orientation throughout the building, for accountability. If we're going to use it to track the fire, to locate the fire, there's different things you can look for, such as heat patterns on the walls. We need to locate egress with our cameras. We have better eyes than anyone else in the structure most often. We can use it to identify ventilation points if, it's, if ventilation is needed. Ongoing size up can be done. Floor temperatures can be monitored with this also, but we need to realize that those aren't always going to be accurate readings, especially if you're considering a, a fire in a basement. Travel upstream and smoke, you will be able to see the smoke, the direction it's moving. If you travel upstream in the smoke, you know, you're going to be going towards the fire. You can look for hidden fire with it. And of course, one of the primary, primary functions is to uh, find and locate victims. Watch temperatures above your head. Knowing that there's a refresh rate, move the camera methodically. The refresh rate is going to happen periodically. When the camera gets oversaturated, it's going to freeze your image for approximately one second. For three seconds, you'll have a small square in the corner. You need to be aware of that. Train yourself to notice that so you don't miss something. During searches, look behind you every 10 steps. That's a good rule of thumb. Or basically, 
every time, if we're talking about a residential fire, every time you enter a different room, you're gonna size the room up from one doorway. After you've made your way through that room and you enter an, a new area, it gets a new size up and you check behind you and, and uh, resize up the one you just came from. It's gonna let you see the areas that you missed. Reset the thermal imaging camera by pointing to the ground or covering with a gloved hand. Resetting the camera is talking about switching from high sensitivity to low sensitivity back and forth. When the camera gets saturated to a point to where it's going to switch to low sensitivity, that's something we need to acknowledge and notice. You're not going to get as good of a picture when the camera goes into low sensitivity. We used to call it firefighting mode. It closes down the aperture, takes in less heat. Your, your picture quality is not as good but it's going to continue to give you a picture. That's how, that's how it works. That's how it's designed to work. But there's ways around going into the low sensitivity mode. If you spot the fire and you make it go into low sensitivity, that means 30% of your screen has reached the top part of the high sensitivity mode. If you, once 30% of your screen reaches that, it's going to switch to low sensitivity. If you point that as something with a lower temperature or cover it with a gloved hand, pointed at the floor, you can usually get that to switch back into high sensitivity and you'll regain a better image to continue your search with. You can also use the firefighter in front of you and cover up part, part of the uh, image also and possibly get it to switch back to high sensitivity. Do not point the crosshairs into the flame. Once you've done that once, once you've pointed it at a high heat source and it's flipped over, you just want to avoid it through the methods we've identified. We already know that the fire's hot. We don't need to continue to look at it. We'll look around it, below it, above it, monitor the ceiling temperatures. We'll turn the camera on. The thermal imager will turn on in basic mode. We talked about the green button. Hit the button, hold it down, the camera comes on. We'll talk about the plus mode later. Within five seconds of turning the camera on, the, the thermal imaging camera carries out a self-test of the sensor and electronics. Status LEDs under display illuminate according to the battery status. The current software version briefly displays and the imager appears after a few seconds on the display. Check the camera function. Direct the camera towards an object or a person, anything emitting heat, and the thermal imager should show us a good, a good image, a good display of that. The camera is now ready for use. Most people will turn these cameras on on the way to the scene so that they can power up and be ready by the time we get there for a size up when approaching a structure. To turn them off, it's very similar. Hit the green button, hold it for three seconds. Three seconds, that way it won't accidentally get shut off if you bump it. Release the button. As soon as all the LED indicators switch off, the camera switched off. Securing the camera during use. Pull the spring-loaded cable out away from the camera body. There's three of these. One at the base of the camera, one on each side of the, dis the display screen. When you pull that out, slide the carabiner through, latch it on, release the cable. The internal springs automatically pull the attachment cable in tight to the camera housing to minim minimize any snags. You're now, you're now ready to uh, clip it to wherever you carry your camera at. We are recommending hooking to the cable attachments on the side of the screen to hopefully carry the camera in a different position and maybe have less lens, lens damage. We typically break quite a few lenses and I believe it's from carrying it from the butt of the handle and letting it hang low, banging into stuff. So carrying it by the side of the screen may prevent some of this damage. On-screen indicators. Number one is the low sensitivity indicator. We talked about how the camera switches uh, when, when you get near a fire, when you get near a, the direct emitter and the screen is overwhelmed, the camera is overwhelmed with heat, it's going to switch to low sensitivity. This is a symbol you're going to get in the top left corner of your screen. You need to recognize this. Your picture quality is going to go down and it's going to be less. And this is where you can point it at the floor, point it at your hand, try to get it back into high sensitivity, have better, better picture quality and continue your search without pointing it directly at the fire. Two is the shutter indicator. We need to recognize that. We already talked about that. There's a green square in the top left corner of the screen. When it shutters, it's refreshing. It's dumping heat and it's preparing to form a new picture for you. So you're going to lose one second. And during a normal scan, you can easily lose 10 to 15 feet of that room. So you'll need to back up and redo that. 
identify the shutter. When it shutters, it's gonna do it more often in a high heat environment. Digital temperature target, that's gonna be in the center. It's gonna be a square box. The old one was a solid green. This one is a, is a hollow green box in the center. When you take a temperature, it's gonna be the temperature of all the pixels in that. Digital temperature indicator is gonna be number four. It's gonna tell you what the temperature of all the pixels in that square box. Number five is your temperature indicator bar on the right side. So as you can see, we have the three vertical. Everything is divided into three vertical segments as per 1801. The color reference bar is at the top of the temperature indicator bar. That just shows when you start getting your orange, yellow, and reds, it shows exactly what temperature it is for the most part. You, as long as you know if you're in high sensitivity or low sensitivity, when you start getting those colors, you'll know what temperatures those are based on what mode you're in. We'll go through those temperatures in a minute. Internal over temperature indicator. If this pops up, you need to remove the camera, get it into a, co a cooler environment because it will end up shutting off on you. And during training, we don't need to be putting our cameras through ex extreme heats for an extreme amount of times. I've seen this, uh, a lot of burn tower stuff, it'll get too hot and it can damage it. So as soon as you see that, you need to get it out and let it cool off. It's gonna take quite some time to cool these off. After turning the camera on, it will be, it will be in high sensitivity mode automatically. The thermal imaging camera will switch from high sensitivity mode to low sensitivity mode in case of extreme heat. Extreme heat for this camera means that approximately one third of that screen has turned red in high sensitivity mode. That's when it's going to switch over to low sensitivity mode. That's 32% of the pixels are above 284 degrees. When that happens, a green triangle will show up in the top left corner. At this time, you're now in low sensitivity mode. The thermal imaging camera will switch back to high sensitivity mode when 89% of the pixels show less than 248 degrees. Shuttering. Periodically, the thermal imaging camera will refresh the focal plane array in order to operate properly. This occurs via the internal shutter mechanism. When the thermal imaging camera shutters, the image freezes for approximately one second. Shutter indicator is a green square in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. It will appear for three seconds before and during the shutter process. Shutter may occur more frequently during greater heat loads. The digital temperature display indicator provides an appro approximate numeric temperature of an object in Celsius or Fahrenheit, depending on how our camera is set. To measure the temperature of an object, name the camera so the digital temperature target in the center of the display is on the object to be measured. As we said, it's gonna give you a reading of all the pictures in the, in the green square. So if you want an actual accurate reading, you need to get the object completely into the green square. Color reference bar, high sensitivity mode. When you're in high sensitivity mode, anything above 291 degrees, below 291 degrees is gonna be in your grayscale. Above 291 degrees will be yellow, above 302 will be orange, and once you get 311, those heat, heat signatures are gonna turn red for you. The main thing we need to notice is when we're in high sensitivity mode is everything over approximately 300 degrees will be red. Once a 30 year screen reaches that, you're gonna to switch to low sensitivity mode. And depending on the environment, everything may go back to shades of gray and white. If you have an extreme high heat, then you'll start picking up more color again and everything over a thousand is going to be yellow. If it's over 1047, it'll be orange. If it's over 1090, it will be red. Your over temperature warning activates when internal system electronics approach maximum recommended operating, operating temperature limits. A red indicator flashes on the center top section of the display area when the camera exceeds operational thermal limits. Internal temperatures above 248 degrees for 20 minutes will give users an acceptable image. Temperatures above that user may start to see degradation of the image. Battery indicator, there's four lights above the green button just below the screen. Four solid green lights, you're gonna have be at 75 to 100%. And as you start losing lights, you lose battery. You get down to two, you're gonna be between 25 and 50%. When you get down, and they're gonna be yellow. When you get down to one light, it's gonna be red. And you're, you're nominal to 25%. When that red light same red light starts flashing, you're gonna be five minutes or less remaining in your battery life. 
assessing the NFPA Plus features. Once the camera is turned on, push and hold the zoom or the palette button, either one of these, for three seconds or until the plus mode indicator appears on the screen. To return to basic mode, briefly push and release the on off button. The digital zoom, once you're in the plus mode, you'll have additional functions with these cameras. Push the zoom button once for two times and the two times indicator will show up in the bottom left corner. Push the zoom button again for four times zoom and then the indicator will show four times. Push the zoom button again to return to standard one time zoom. The zoom indicator turns off. Push and hold the zoom button for two seconds to skip immediately back to one time zoom. With all these options, if you ever get turned around in these options, you can always hit the green power button, take you out of plus mode, take you back to basic with no zoom and no color palette, no bells and whistles. Color palette selection. If you push the color palette button above the green button on the right to access the available color palettes, the color palette indicator display a label for the selected palette. Each push of the palette button steps the camera to the next available palette. Push and hold the palette button for two seconds to return to the white hot palette. We need to be conscious of what palette selection we're in at all times. Some are not suitable for fire situations. The white hot palette that we've been talking about is what most of us are familiar with and what we're going to use most of the time. White hot palette. Hottest objects appear white, coldest objects appear black, other objects are shades of gray. Red, yellow, and orange show temperature increases. The black hot palette. Hottest objects appear black, coldest objects appear white. Other objects appear in shades of gray. Red, yellow, and orange show temperature increases. I would use caution with this. This is completely the opposite of what we've done for the last 10 plus years. Fire and ice. This and other palettes. Uh, we can use them, play around with them. I don't know if they'll have much use to us on the fire ground. Uh, sometimes they have, they're applicable to hazmat incidences, but you can feel free to play around with them. The fire and ice is based on white hot, the hottest image red, coldest image blue, no other colors applied. Iron bow, images colorized with dark purple, light purple, orange, yellow, white, and black. Coldest to hottest, black being hottest. Rain. Images colorized with purple, green, yellow, orange, red, white, gray, and black. Coldest to hottest, black being hottest. Again, we're used to white being hot, and with all these colors involved, it's going to be a difficult image to interpret. Search and rescue mode. White hot mode with increased contrast. The other difference with the search and rescue mode is that we're not going to have the color palette at the high end of your spectrum. You're also going to lose your temperature bar on the right side. Uh, we've also, it's not written, we haven't tested this under fire conditions, but with the increased contrast and the better picture, you're absorbing heat at a higher rate and it's giving you a better picture. We don't believe this is going to be one that's applicable to using on the fire scene. Compass selection. Compass must be calibrated before use. These will probably be calibrated before they're put in your hands, although there could, it could come a time you need to calibrate it yourself. The thermal imaging camera must be held within 45 degrees of vertical for the compass to obtain an accurate reading. If tilted too far, indicator displays a double equal sign instead of the direction in the bottom left corner. There might come a time when you need to calibrate your compass. When you do your daily check, if you figure out which direction is due north, south, one direction or the other, point your compass that direction as we've talked about. And if it doesn't give you an accurate reading, you can calibrate it yourself. 
they'll be calibrated before you get it. But if you find you need to recalibrate, take your camera, turn it upside down, press both these buttons at the same time. Hold them down for three to five seconds. At that time, you'll get a display screen on the camera. It's going to tell you exactly what to do from here on out. All you have to do is hit a button, which is going to be the magnifying glass, is now going to be the scroll button. You're going to have a whole list of options. Go down to the compass. The opposite button is going to be select. You select compass. Once you select your compass, it's going to walk you through uh, recalibrating it. It's going to ask you to tumble the camera for, for a couple minutes until it says stop. Once it says stop, you're going to be able to scroll, exit out of this, and be done with your calibration. You'll be good. Now bring it back up, point it to due north, whichever direction you've identified is true, and see, see if you're accurate. If you're not accurate, make sure you don't have any, any interference. Make sure you, there's no electrical fields interfering with the camera and there's no other issues going on with it. Moving on. As with the compass, strong electrical fields may give a false reading. Understand that the compass is an aid for navigation, as is no substitute for proper training. Laser range finder. Don't aim the laser into the eyes of your crew or other crews, as it could result in damage. The laser range finder is also something that you're going to access from the plus mode. To take a measurement, pull and hold the trigger. Aim the laser at the object to be measured, release the trigger, and you will have the measurement on your screen displayed in feet. If it's not displayed in feet, again, what we just went through with the compass, you'll be able to put it back where it needs to be there if it's, if it's in meters. The minimum distance that you can measure is 15 feet. The maximum distance is 210 feet. If you're beyond that range or less than that range, uh, it will give you a symbol that shows that. It will not measure in heavy smoke, steam, or if dirt or water is on the rangefinder lens. The lens is something you need to continually keep clean. It's easy for dirt and insulation to build up on there that will also distort or completely block an image. Shutter indicator is a green square that appears in the upper left. <laughs> I gotta <have> it. <laughs> uh, Shuttering. What?